Hello again, friends. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned to you how this time of isolation is proving to be a time when many people are getting on with projects around the home. Now, I reckon when it comes to those kinds of projects, there's at least two different types of person. On the one hand, there's that type of person who will read the instructions very carefully. They'll know the method, they'll work it out, and they'll aim to get it right. On the other hand, there's the type of person who will throw away the instruction booklet and they will follow their instinct. They'll follow their gut feel in order to try and, and get it right. I wonder what type of person you are. Uh, over the years, I've changed my approach. I used to be a follow your instinct kind of guy, but I've come to realise that when you have other people in your life, they don't always appreciate the choose your own adventure a way of doing things. And they're quite right, because when you follow the program, when you follow the instructions, you are going to get a much better result. It doesn't matter whether it's putting together an item that you've just received out of a, a package in the mail or, or cooking up a dish in the kitchen or trying to find your way across town um, using, using a map or, or using your gut instinct. Uh, if you follow the instructions, if you work out a plan, you will get a much better result. What we have here in Psalm 6 is a four-step plan. Not a plan to put together an item of furniture or a plan to cook up a, a delicious meal or a plan to get across town, but rather it's a plan to put into action when life starts crumbling around us. Many of us know the feeling of a life that's starting to spiral out of control. And certainly in this time of pandemic, those feelings are heightened for a whole array of people. Uh, nobody is sure about what the next few months will bring and life often presents serious challenges and that is, well, it's never been truer than right now, has it? My question today is about how we respond to that challenge of, of difficulties in life. Uh, on one hand, we could follow our instinct. We could forge our own path. And that might take a, a number of different forms. It might involve self-medication. It might involve self-blame. It might involve blaming others, anger. It might involve a, a loss of all kinds of hope. I think these are approaches that we can easily fall back upon. But I'd like to suggest that just like following an impulse can create a disaster in the kitchen or, or lead us down a, a dark alley, a, a place where we don't want to be, so too following your impulses when it comes to dealing with life, life's difficulties, that can make a bad situation worse. The, the other approach is to find a guide and to follow what, what it says. Now, elsewhere in the book of Psalms, we read that God's word is a light to our path, a guide for our feet. And so it's the Bible that gives us an alternative way forward. And one example of that is what we have here in Psalm 6. Now, in this psalm, I see four steps that we can take in troubled times. Step number one, turn to God. Step number two, reason with God. Step number three, Grieve before God. And step number four, trust in God. Turn, reason, grieve, trust. Four steps that are laid out in that order as we read through the psalm. So here are four steps for troubled times that we can take according to God's word. So the first step, turn towards God. David writes from verse 1. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord? How long? When you're in trouble, you may need to swallow your pride and ask for help. I remember a time when I was a young adult and 
I went for a drive out to Bathurst with a church friend of mine. And he was a, a student at the Bathurst campus of Charles Sturt University and he had an assignment that he needed to hand in uh, person to person. This is in the days before electronic uh, submission of assignments and so he had to hop in the car and drive out there and so I thought I'd go along for the ride, keeping him company. And so we arrived in Bathurst and my friend submitted his assignment. Then we turned around and we started on our journey home. But as we started on our journey home, we realised that the surrounding countryside looked a little bit different. And then we entered into a town which was named Perthville. And we realised that well, this town was not one we went through on our way into Bathurst. And now on our way back again, we'd taken a wrong turn. We were lost. We didn't know where Perthville was. So we had to swallow our pride and we had to ask for help. I had to ask for directions. And so we pulled into a, a service station and my friend was driving the car and as we pulled to a, to a halt, he, he turned and he looked at me and he said, well, out you go, you, you, you go and ask them. And I kind of grumbled and I opened the door and, and out I went. And as I was leaving the car, he called out after me. He said, hey, don't tell them you're from Sydney. <laughs> because they'll probably roll their eyes and think, oh, these, these city boys. Tell them you're from Bathurst. <laughs> it's, it's funny the things that we feel embarrassed about. However, there do come the, the odd occasion. There does come the odd occasion when we, we need to recognise that we're out of our depth. We need to find the person who can help us. Now, David realises that he is out of his depth. And so who does he turn to? Who's the person he turns to for help? Well, he turns to God, doesn't he? Turning to God involves a number of things, including repenting of our sins. And when I talk about repenting of sins, I mean turning away from our, our sinful lives and turning, turning to God, turning back to him and seeking to live, to live his way. In verse 1, David seems to admit that his problems are a result of God's discipline that his hardship has been brought about by God's anger. Now, it is possible that our sins can bring about God's discipline in the here and now. We read in the New Testament that the Corinthian Christians were disciplined by God because they weren't treating Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, in a, in a worthy way. And we also read in Acts chapter 5 of Ananias and Sapphira who were struck down by God because they decided to lie to the church. So it is possible for our hardships in this life to be a result of God disciplining us. So I, I think it's therefore prudent to confess our sins to God and to turn away from, from them, to, to ask God to, to hold off in his wrath, to, to hold off his anger. As David asks in verse 1, Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. But on the other hand, we also need to recognise that sometimes we experience hardship simply because we live in a broken and distorted world. Uh, three of the most righteous characters in the Bible, Joseph in the book of Genesis, Job also in the Old Testament, and even Jesus himself who was sinless, they all experienced hardship, even though they each remained a great shining example of godly virtue. Sometimes we experience difficulty simply because we live in a broken world. And so verses 2 and 3 are useful for saint and sinner alike. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord? How long? These are words that anyone with experience in this world can echo. I am faint, in agony, in deep anguish. How long, Lord? How long? Can we ever tell the difference between suffering as a result of a personal chastisement because of something that we've done wrong or suffering just in a general sense, on account of a, of a broken world. Can we tell the difference between the two? Which is which? Not without a direct word from God about our specific circumstances. So we ought to be wary not to jump to a conclusion about what's going on for us in, in, a, in, a, in a quick and hasty manner. But the Bible does impress upon us 
that turning to God is at some point necessary for each one of us. Because even if God does hold off discipline in this life, he certainly will hold us accountable in the next. We learn in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, that we're each, de- each destined to die once and, to after, and after that to face judgment. And unless we've lived a life of perfect obedience to God and his ways, then that judgment will be a problem for us. And so this first step is a vital one for everyone, regardless of whether you're experiencing trouble in the present or, or whether trouble is a long, long way away. It's a vital step for each one of us. Swallow your pride, recognise your helplessness, recognise your sin, and turn to God. That's the first step. Uh, step two, reason with God. Have a listen to the way David prays from verse 4. Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Among the dead, no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? One of the lessons in prayer that I've learnt in, in recent months is not to be afraid to reason with God in prayer, to give God a reason for hearing us and answering our prayers. I was first challenged to pray in this way when last year we were preaching through the Old Testament book of Exodus. I noticed the way Moses would speak with God, and this was particularly clear for me in chapter 32 of Exodus, when the Israelites had fashioned this golden calf and God is rightly very angry with them. But Moses reasons with God. He says to them, basically, these are the people you've rescued, Lord. Surely your mercy ought to to fall upon them. You've made promises to these people and to their ancestors. So surely, Lord, you, you can relent from your anger. Moses reasons with God on the basis of what he knows of God's promises and of what he knows of God's character. It wasn't long afterwards that I was able to put this type of prayer into practice as I prayed by David Loke's bedside in Royal North Shore Hospital last September. Now, many of us were praying for David at that time. But I remember reasoning with God, saying, Father, you raised Jesus from the dead, so surely you can heal David at this moment. And Father, if you heal David, surely that will give the church, your church, great reason to come before you with great with great thankfulness. So let your mercy fall upon him and heal his body, Lord. And of course, that's exactly what what God did. Uh, And I'm not saying it was my prayer that made the difference because we were all praying, weren't we? And we learned from Acts chapter 12 when Peter was in prison and the whole church was praying for Peter that, that when the church prays together, it's very, very powerful. But what I am saying is that it was a new way of praying for me And it's a way which is modelled for us in the scriptures, especially here in verses 4 and 5 of Psalm 6. How does David reason with God? Save me because of your unfailing love, he says. Uh, Lord, you're known for your faithfulness. You are known for your unfailing love. And so demonstrate that love by saving me from this situation I'm in. And then verse 5. Among the dead... Who proclaims your name? Who praises you from the grave? David is saying, Lord, if you save me, then there'll be one more voice, active voice, live voice to praise you in in earshot of all everyone else who who is alive as well. When we talk about reasoning with God, we're not talking about trying to blackmail God and we're not talking about coming to some kind of negotiation where God gives away something and we give away something. Rather, it's a type of prayer where we demonstrate our understanding of who God is and our understanding of his plan. And we're seeking a kind of win-win. We're seeking to align our requests with what God wants to do. Lord, here's my request and you ought to answer it because this will bring you great glory and this is in line with your character. It'll it'll, It'll be of great help to your church. That's the kind of reasoning we're talking about. It's that kind of reasoning we see with David And we see in other places of the Bible, seeking common purpose with God rather than trying to cut some kind of sneaky deal. So that's the second step, reasoning with God. The third step also involves what I think is an underutilized mode of praying. 
the pouring out of your grief to God. Listen to David from verse 6. I am worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my woes. I wonder whether you've been so sad that you've drenched your pillow with tears. David has. And God doesn't have a problem hearing from David in this way. Another word for this grief-filled prayer is a prayer of lament. And I don't think in our discussion of prayer, we really talk about prayers of lament all that much. A prayer is something you learn. And when I was learning to pray, I was taught a couple of neat acronyms to help me remember how to pray and what prayer was all about. I learned about teaspoon prayers, TSP, short for teaspoon, also short for thank you, sorry, please, thank you, God, sorry, God, please, God, here are my requests, teaspoon prayer. I also learned about uh, praying with the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S, A for adoration, God, you are magnificent and worthy because of all these things, Uh, C, confession, God, I'm sorry for my sins. T, thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for your blessings shown to me. And S, supplication, bringing our requests before God. Acts. Now, both of those acronyms, TSP and Acts, are very useful, but neither of them have an L for lament or a G for grief. And yet, lamenting before God, grieving before God, mourning our our sadness before God, Uh, These remain types of prayers that we find throughout the Bible, and it's a prayer that God responds to. Again, in the book of Exodus, the Israelites are in slavery, and they're being treated badly by the Egyptians. The Egyptians are setting them impossible targets for their labour. The Egyptians have even started to kill off their children. And so the Israelites pray. They groaned in their slavery and cried out, And their cry for help because of their slavery went up for God. Kind of like a a please God and a lament prayer. Welded together here. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. I'm not saying God is waiting to hear us cry. I'm not saying that it's okay to be a, a spoilt and insufferable whinger. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that as our Heavenly Father, we have an intimate relationship with God. And when we are grieving, it moves Him. And so this remains a very biblical and very appropriate way to pray when we are faced with tough times, to come before God in our grief, to offer a lament before Him. And finally, our fourth step Place your trust in God. Fourth step, place your trust in God. As he concludes his psalm, David demonstrates this this unflappable faith in God, this this trust that God has heard him and that God will act. From verse 8, Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be overwhelmed with shame and anguish. They will turn back and suddenly be put to shame. One thing to note in these final verses is that David's problems haven't disappeared. Uh, He's still surrounded by his enemies. And so that's why he says, away from me, because they're still right there. They're still near him. And right at the very end of the psalm, uh, David talks about a future point when his enemies will be defeated. It hasn't happened yet. He uses the future tense. Uh, They will be overwhelmed. But note this, he doesn't wait for his situation to be resolved before he expresses his trust in God. After offering his prayer to God, he expresses his trust in God straight away. The Lord has heard my weeping. He has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. Even though the trouble hasn't ceased, he knows that God has heard and that God will act. Now, This is a remarkable belief on behalf of David, that God has heard and that God will act. Uh, Sometimes when I look for help, 
I find myself becoming a little bit cynical. Recently, just this week in fact, Jasmine and I sat down and we reviewed some of the insurance policies that we have in place. Now, if there's one mob who you want to come to your aid when you need it, it's your insurance company. But as we were reading through these policies, it seemed to us there were so many caveats put in place. It seemed to us they were looking for every opportunity to not pay out on any claim we might bring before them. In fact, Jasmine said at one point, what we really need is, is a percentage of how many claims they actually pay up on. Uh, what, is, what is their record? What is their history of paying out claims that come before them? That's what we really need to know. Now, David doesn't tell us why he's so trusting of God. But I suspect he knows something of God's record. He knows something of God's past, of God's history. In particular, I think he knows something of of Israel's history and the fact that God heard the prayers of the Israelites and he answered those prayers. And so David looks to what he knows of God and that encourages him to have great trust in this God to whom he's praying. For those of us who live in this modern age, we have even more evidence of God's faithfulness and commitment towards us. We've seen it most clearly in the ministry of Jesus, a ministry demonstrating a a commitment to us that took Jesus all the way to the cross. A ministry which, because it wipes away the sins that we confess, a ministry which makes us God's children and guarantees us a hearing from the Father. One of the great gifts for all those who've confessed their sins and who've received the forgiveness that Jesus enables is this assurance of faith, just like David is assured. This assurance of faith to know that if we come before God, he will hear us and he will answer us in in the way that he knows best. Trouble will never disappear, but it need not destroy us because we can know that God is nearby. So put your trust, put your faith in him. When this crisis began, I, I said to all of you that it's a crisis that brings with it both threat and opportunity. Psalm 6 can act as a guide, helping us take advantage of the opportunities that are coming with this crisis. And the opportunity, I think, is this, to recognise our weakness and to draw near to God and experience his love and experience his care I'm not quite sure we're going to be that effective if we keep on trying to forge our own way. There might be one or two occasions where we overcome the obstacles that are in front of us, but sooner or later, friends, we're going to come across an obstacle that's just too big. And so we'll have to turn somewhere. And Psalm 6 gives us a guide. Turn to God, reason with him, grieve before him, and put your trust in him. I'll lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words of David and ask that they might instruct us when trouble comes our way. We turn to you, confessing our sins, confessing our weakness, and we ask that you hear our prayer because your answer can be a great demonstration that you are merciful, that you're gracious, that you can turn fear into hope, grieving into joy. And we do grieve before you. We grieve about the terrible experiences that many of us have endured throughout our lives. But as Paul says, we don't grieve without hope because we know of Jesus and the faithfulness shown to us through him. And so we continue to trust you, Father. You won't let us down. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.